Okay, good morning, everybody. My name is Alberto Mangiaforello, and my supervisor is Fulvio Corno, and today I will present you my PhD thesis that is entitled End User Development in the Internet of Things. So I would like to start this presentation by contextualizing these three years of research and by providing an overview of the issues I try to address and my general goal as well. So the starting point of my research is the continuous and rapid growth of the Internet of Things. The IoT is nowadays a recognized paradigm for a network of objects, devices, and services uh, always connected to the Internet. And furthermore, the IoT can be seen from a wider perspective by also considering all the web applications that we typically use every day, like social networks and messaging applications. So the result is a complex network of connected entities, both physical and virtual, that can communicate between each other with humans and with the environment in many, many different contexts, ranging from smart cities to smart homes. So in this domain, the end user development vision aims at empowering end users to personalize their own connected entities on the basis of their personal needs. Nowadays, in particular, end users can exploit many different tools to directly program the joint behavior of their devices and services. And perhaps the most common tool in this field is if this, then that. So typically, the adopted programming paradigm is the trigger action programming. And users can take advantage of platforms like if this, then that to define if the rules, such as if the surveillance camera recognizes me, then turn on the smart thermostat, or if I publish a post on Facebook, then share it also on Twitter automatically. And independently of the used platform, users must follow similar uh, wizard-based procedures to define rules. Defining a rule means defining separately a trigger and an action to be linked together. And to define the two parts of the rule, users must first select a generic connected entity to be involved. Then they can select the specific trigger or action. And finally, they can complete the trigger or the action with any additional details. And uh, the video uh, exemplifies uh, such a rule definition process in If This Then That. By clicking on the This button, the user can start to define the trigger. So by browsing a long menu of supported devices and services, she, she can select um, a connected entity to be used for monitoring the trigger. In this case, the user will select uh, the location provider of her smartphone. Then the user can select a specific event to be monitored by the chosen service. In this case, she selects a trigger to monitor the entering in a specific geographical area. And finally, the user completes the trigger with the required details, for example, the specific geographical area. And after defining the trigger, the user clicks on the dead button and she repeats the same three steps to link an action. Despite apparent simplicity, however, the definition of trigger action rules is not an easy task, especially for users who do not have any programming experience. So in my PhD, uh, I addressed three different issues related to the definition of trigger action rules. The first one is about the low level of abstraction of contemporary trigger action programming. Uh, as you have seen in the video, the adopted representation models uh, strongly depends on the adopted technologies. To make an example, uh, choose smart devices or online services that provide equivalent or identical functions like setting a temperature in a room, but differ in brands or manufacturers are treated as completely distinct entities. And this approach poorly adapts to the increasing complexity of the IoT. And as the number of available connected entities grows, defining if then rules becomes a complex task for, for non-programmers. The second issue is strictly related to the first one. Uh, a consequence of the low level of abstraction is that the number of possible combinations among triggers and actions of different entities is high. And user interfaces provide users with too much information. And the third issue is that given the current complexity of trigger action programming, making mistakes is very common, especially for, for non-programmers. But runtime problems uh, in this context 
can lead to unpredictable and even dangerous behaviors, such as a door that is unexpectedly unlocked. So one of the most important and urgent challenge in this field is the need to avoid possible conflicts and to assess the rule currentness. So given the reported issues, the goal of my PhD program was to assist end users in easily and efficiently personalizing the functionality of their connected entities with the aim of simplifying the definition of if then rules. <clears throat> I focused my goal by targeting one by one the three identified issues. So my thesis can be divided into three main parts mainly. To overcome the low level of abstraction issue, I envisioned a new type of programming environments able to support a higher level uh, representation of connected entities. To address the information overload issue, I instead explored how to support users in discovering and managing new rules and related functionality. And finally, I considered the runtime problem issue by exploring the adoption of end user debugging <coughs> solutions in trigger action programming platforms. So let's start with the first part of the thesis and in particular with its main outcome that is a point, an ontological high level representation for end user development in the IoT. We designed a point by focusing on three main points. First, our goal was to empower users to program their devices and services with a higher level of abstraction mm -hmm. without being aware of all the technological <coughs> stuff needed to define rules. Second, we tried to uh, shift the programming approach from vendor-centric to functionality-centric. So instead of focusing on the specific Nest thermostat, for example, we focused on what a generic thermostat can do, like increasing the temperature of a room or notifying the user when it's cold. And finally, we envision context-dependent rules that can be adapted to different contextual situations. Therefore, the main idea behind our work is to help users to define rules like, if I enter any defined location, any location that I can control, then, send, then set its temperature to 20 Celsius degree, independently of the context and of the involved technologies. We integrated this vision into a pond the ontology allows the modeling of abstract and trigger action rules that can be adapted to different contextual situations. With the model, in particular, users can define rules based on their final functionality, independently of the involved locations and technologies. And moreover, the model supports the execution of such rules with a three-layer architecture. Indeed, a pond is able to map the abstract rules in the trigger action programming layer with real devices and services able to reproduce the desired behaviors. Such a mapping is performed by reasoning on the IoT ecosystem layer um, and the shared contextual information. And to do this automatically, we use a set of, of SWRL rules. SWRL is a language of the semantic web that can be used to dynamically add knowledge to the ontology based on the evaluation of semantic rules. As shown in the slide, each layer in the ontology is composed of a set of top level classes ca that can be instantiated and connected together by means of different object properties. The trigger action programming layer is composed of rules, triggers and actions, contextual information models, uh, users and locations. And the IoT layer instead is composed of different classes that describe connected entities. Each entity can offer one or more services that model entities' capabilities, and each service may have commands and may generate uh, notifications. And finally, the allow to object property is the ability connection that can be instantiated by the SWRR rule. And such a connection along with the information stored in the shared contextual layer can be used at runtime by trigger action programming platforms to execute LPONT rules onto real connected entities according to the contextual situation. Rules in LPONT can be defined at two different levels of abstraction, high and medium. The graph shows some location triggers. High level triggers are generic event to be verified, like entering a place and they don't include any 
in technical detail nor the connected entity to be used. So these events could be potentially monitored in different ways, through a camera, the smartphone GPS, and so on. Also, medium-level triggers do not include technical details such as brands or manufacturers, uh, but they specify a generic connected entity to be used. So they mention, for example, cameras and, and doors. Also, actions can be defined at high and medium level. In the graph, there are some temperature-related actions. Increase and lower temperature are two high-level actions that can be reproduced in different ways, while medium-level actions refer to specific devices such as thermostats and windows. We conducted a user study to evaluate the effectiveness and the understandability of the OPON model in the definition of if-then rules. The study involved 30 university students coming from different backgrounds. <clears throat> Our aim was to understand whether the OPON representation helped users define if-then rules effectively and efficiently, especially with respect to representation models of contemporary trigger action programming platforms like if this and that. We followed a within subject procedure. Um, each participant completed five different tasks by using two web interfaces, one with triggers and actions of if this and that, and the other one with uh, upon triggers and actions. A task was composed of a scenario and a goal. The scenario described a generic user and their devices and services while the goal defined a specific need of the user that could be satisfied through one or more if-then rules. Results of the study uh, show that the LPO representation reduced the errors made by the participants in solving the tasks and also the time needed to define each different rule. In fact, we found a significant difference in incorrect triggers and actions between the two interfaces so by using the if this then that interface, participants were more likely to introduce errors in their triggers and actions. Looking at the results, we also found that the average time needed for defining rules was significantly lower with the OPONT interface. So we can conclude that by overcoming the low level of abstraction of if this and that, <coughs> and by representing triggers and actions on the basis of their high level functionality, upon simplified, let's say, the definition of if then rules. This was confirmed also by the analysis of the qualitative data we collected during the study. By interviewing participants, however, we also understood that while moving towards a higher level of abstraction is, let's say, a promising approach, it also poses new important challenges that could inform uh, future works in this field. Abstract behaviors such as light up a place or send a message, for example, could be potentially reproduced in many different ways on the basis of the current context. But how can we decide how to, uh, how to reproduce them? Uh, which is the best solution for a given user? And even by being able to reproduce abstract behaviors, uh, our studies show that users have different preferences regarding the level of abstraction to be adopted and some participants highlighted security and privacy issues in the execution of triggers and actions that are abstract in nature. So uh, besides using a pawn for directly defining rules, we started to use it uh, for addressing the other two issues we identified at the beginning of our work. And in this case, we followed a different approach we maintained the same representation models of contemporary platforms by adding on top of them tools for assisting users in discovering and debugging if there are So now I will present you the second part of this thesis. It is related to the information overload issue. As I already mentioned, uh, the number of possible combinations among triggers and actions in contemporary platform is very high and the number of rules shared on this platform is continuously growing. To solve this issue, we use the OPON model to help users discover triggers and actions on the basis of their needs. And the main outcomes of this work are an optimization tool for trigger action programming named Audio Optimizer, and a recommender system of if then rules named RecRules. And for time reasons, in this presentation, I will focus on recruits. 
we developed it as a hybrid and semantic recommender system of trigger action rules. The goal of the algorithm is to perform top end recommendations of new rules to be used on the basis of their final functionality. So by abstracting details such as brands or manufacturers. As I explained before, when talking about a point, uh, focusing on the underlying functionality of, of if the rules is the main idea behind, I would say, all our work. And in this particular work, it's easy to see why a recommender system may be useful because a personalization goal of a user can be typically reproduced in many different ways through different functionality. So let's suppose that we want to personalize the temperature of our indoor environments when we are going to use them. By exploiting platforms like If This Then That, we have several possibilities. We can start by setting the temperature on the Nest thermostat in our home at a given hour. And we can do the same for the Netatmo thermostat in the office. Obviously, we can use such an approach for different times of the day. For example, to turn on the office thermostat in the morning while turning it off in the evening. And besides using the time of the day, we can also use other ways to identify the fact that we are entering or leaving a place. For example, we could use our smartphone position to identify that we are near home. And furthermore, besides thermostats, we can personalize other temperature related devices as well, like the bathroom heater or the air conditioning system in the office. And finally, we can also imagine alternative ways of influencing, of influencing the temperature of an environment like opening a window. So to help users discover all these alternative routes and functionality, we designed the Recruits Recommender System. And the figure shows the architecture of the algorithm. It first builds a knowledge graph that incorporates both content-based and collaborative information. Content-based information in particular are extracted through a semantic reasoning process over the Eupont ontology. Then Recruits extracts features from the graph based on different types of connections among the graph items, and it uses such connection-based features to train a learning-to-rank model. To exemplify how Recruits builds a knowledge graph and how it can exploit it, let's consider the two rules reported in the slide. The first one turns on the Philips Hue lamp in the kitchen when the Nest camera recognizes the user. And the second one instead opens the blinds when the homeboy camera in the living room detects a movement. <clears throat> Rules are instantiated in the graph and connected to users through feedback relationships. This is the collaborative part of the graph. Feedback can be of different types depending on the exploited data set. So we can model explicit ratings, but also implicit feedback as well. Then rules are linked to content-based information. This includes technological details, such as the specific trigger sections, brands, and manufacturers, the orange ovals, but also the hierarchy of open classes characterizing triggers and actions. The algorithm, in particular, recursively extracts medium and high-level classes for each trigger and action involved in the graph. And from the complete graph, Recruits is able uh, to extract two different types of connection between, between users and rules. So as I highlighted in the slide, collaborative connections represent a connection between a user um, and a rule uh, by means of other users. Technology connections instead uh, are connections between users and rules that involve information such as specific triggers, brands, and manufacturers only. And finally, functionality connections involve Eupont information only. So they connect users and rules by means of functionality information. To compute top-end recommendations, the extracted features are used to build a ranking model from training data by exploiting a learning to rank technique. And different can, techniques can be used for this purpose. They can be classified into three main categories, point-wise, pair-wise, and least-wise approaches. In Recruits, we explored three baseline learning to rank algorithms, one for each category, uh, random forest, rank boost, and lambda mark. We evaluated Recruits 
to different offline experiments with the real world data uh, with the aim of understanding to what extent the different types of features influence the recommendation accuracy and to compare our algorithm with state-of-the-art recommendation systems. For our experiments, we exploited um, a public data set of if this and that rule. Uh, first, we compared the performance of the three implemented learning to rank techniques in two different configurations. Um, we first trained each algorithm by exploiting collaborative and technology connections, the CT configuration in the table. Um, and we then repeated the experiment by adding functionality connection, the CTF configuration. As you can see from the table, the usage of functionality connections increased the recommendation accuracy for all the measured metrics uh, and for all the three algorithms. Uh, this suggests that by extracting similarities between rules in terms of shared functionality, the recommender system is able to suggest rules even for rarely used devices and applications on the basis of the actual user needs. In a second experiment, we then compared rec rules in its best setting, that is random forest in the CTF configuration with state-of-the-art recommendation algorithms. And we can see from the table that rec rules outperformed all the other algorithms for all the evaluated metrics. And an important finding is that the algorithm performed better also with respect to other algorithms able to support semantic attributes, the ones uh, uh, highlighted in the table. So this suggests that the potential of our approach is not in the usage of semantic information only, but is in its usage as a graph. So this is confirmed by the result of the entity graph embedding, an algorithm that is also able to exploit knowledge graphs. In this case, we tested the algorithm with the same knowledge graph used by Recruits, and we obtained positive results. Recruits, however, performed better, so we can conclude that capturing path-based features in terms of shared functionality is a promising approach. There are many possible applications of our recommendation techniques in the field of trigger action programming. In one of our current work, for example, we are using REC rules to support users during the rule definition process. So the tool shown in the video continuously adapts recommendations to the rules that the user is currently defined. It suggests new rules on the basis of the user history, and it is also able to suggest relevant actions to autocomplete a defined trigger. Okay, so after the information overload issue, the last part of this thesis focuses on the need of avoiding conflicts among rules and assessing their correctness. Previous work started to address this challenge by leveraging software engineering techniques to formally verify rules behavior. Instead of checking rules offline, we instead try to support users during the rule definition process by providing them with debugging mechanisms. We started by reviewing previous work on rule analysis in different contexts with the aim of identifying the problems to be checked and avoided. And we settled on three main control flow bugs, uh, loops, redundancies, and inconsistencies. Loops arise when a set of if-then rules are continuously activated without reaching a stable state. The three rules reported in the slide are an example. They are repeated indefinitely and they continuously post a photo in three different places. Redundancies instead arise when two or more rules are activated at the same time and they reproduce similar functionality. Here, for example, a very similar tweet is posted at the same time because uh, the first two rules uh, share the same trigger, while the second rule um, implicitly activates the third one. Finally, there are inconsistencies. They arise when uh, rules that are activated at the same time try to execute contradictory actions. In the example, when I'm leaving home, the lamp is turned off and the thermostat is put to away mode, 
unfortunately, the third rule is also activated and the lamp is also turned on. So we are sending two contradictory commands to our lamp at the same time. So to model and check loops, inconsistencies and redundancies in if then rules, we defined a novel formalism based on petri nets and semantic technologies. We called it SCPN, semantic colored petri nets. Petri nets are directed graphs in which directed arcs connect places uh, and uh, transitions. Places may hold tokens, which are used to study the dynamic behavior of the net. We choose petri nets since they can naturally describe the rules as well as their non-deterministic and concurrent environment. So by firing a transition at a time, tokens move in the net by giving the idea of a possible execution flow. SCPN defines different types of places and transitions. And to exemplify it, I will show you now how the inconsistency example of before is modeled with the, with the SCPN network. I reported again the three rules that are involved, R1, R2, and R3. And uh, let's suppose that the user already defined R1 and R2 in the past days, and now she has the final tree and she's, going, she's about to save it. <clears throat> let's start by modeling the first rule. The trigger and the action are modeled as places, while the transition uh, that connect uh, T1 and A1 is the rule, R1. Now let's add the second rule to the network, R2. And now since the two triggers, T1 and T2 are equals, I exit home. The associated places are connected to a parent place, T12, through a copy transition. And let's now add the uh, the third rule that the user has just defined, R3, same formalism of before. However, we can notice that the action of the second rule, that is set the nest to away mode, implicitly activates the trigger of the third rule. The nest is set to away mode. So the formalism provides an activate transition to model such a behavior. And this is the final net. And here comes the second ingredient of our approach, the semantic web, and in particular, the Eupont ontology. We used our model to enrich petri nets, and in particular places, with information about the functionality of triggers and actions, so their Eupont classes, with the aim of detecting conflicts among those. So we add to each places of the net a color that is simply a label representing the functionality of the related trigger or action. Here in the figure, for example, the color of A1 is lights off, uh, while the color of A3 is lights off. And the generated model can be used to analyze the runtime behavior of the rules and find conflicts. In this case, a token is put in the trigger, I exit on, it is the, the root node of the net, and we can see what happens when the net is executed. So transitions fire and tokens move in the net, And when uh, the net execution ends, we can see that there are two tokens, one in A1 and one in A3, that on the basis of the color, represent the execution of two contradictory actions in terms of final functionality on the same lamp. So we integrated the SCPN formalism in two different end-user debugging tools for trigger action programming, UDebug and MyIoT Pad. With the first one, UDebug, we added the debugging features on top of an if this then that like interface. So the tool enables end users to debug their rules at definition time according to two main strategies. With the first one, the tool analyzes all the rules of the user and it highlights possible problems that the rule that is being defined may generate. If needed, the user can further inspect the problem with a step-by-step -step simulation of the problematic rules. And this is the second debugging strategy. As you can see in the video, users compose if-then rules in a if-this-then-that-like interface. 
The tool uses SCPN to dynamically analyze uh, the defined rules and it highlights possible runtime problems by allowing the step-by-step -step simulation of the problem in order to provide users with an explanation of the detected inconsistencies, loops, and redundancies. We ran an exploratory study with 15 participants to evaluate whether UDebug helps <coughs> them to debug their trigger action rules. And we were guided by two main research questions, one related to the understandability of the detected problems, and the other one related to the strategies we adopted for assisting users. So we investigated whether highlighting a problem is sufficient or whether a user needs a step-by-step -step simulation to better understand the problem. Each participant used our tool to compose 12 predefined trick direction rules that generated five different problems, two inconsistencies, two redundancies, and one loop. Problems were of different, let's say, nature. Two problems were direct in the sense that they involved two rules only with the same trigger and two problematic actions. The other three problems were instead indirect because they were caused by the implicit activation of a chain of rules. When the definition of a rule generated a problem, participants could use the step-by-step -step simulation and at the end, they had to decide whether to save or not the defined rule. And moreover, they had also to provide an interpretation of the problem and of their choices. The first result that we found, thanks to our study, is that different problems are <clears throat> differently perceived by end users. Participants, for example, uh, considered loops and inconsistencies as dangerous behaviors while they accepted the redundancies, at least in some cases. In particular, participants discarded the rule that generated a loop in 80% of cases, and this percentage was even higher when the, when the rule generated an inconsistency. However, when faced with, with a rule that generated a redundancy, partip participants behaved uh, differently. More than 40% of rules that generated a redundancy were consciously saved anyway. In many cases, in fact, participants were interested in the final result and they didn't consider multiple similar actions <coughs> as, as a problem. The second finding of our work is related to the understanding of the detected problems. Um, we found that some problems were more difficult to understand than others loops and in general indirect problems, for example, uh, were often misinterpreted. So we found that loops were misinterpreted in 40% of cases, while misinterpretations were instead significantly lower for the other classes of problems. A consistent difference uh, also emerged between direct and indirect problems. Indirect problems were misinterpreted more often than direct ones. And this is, for example, an interpretation of a participant when facing a loop that continuously posted the same photo in three different places. And this interpretation was actually very common among participants. They often understood that the rules involved in the loop implicitly activated each other, but they didn't recognize that the last rule of the loop reactivated the first one. In other words, they didn't understand the infinite nature of the loop. <clears throat> and the last finding of our work is that highlighting a problem is often uh, not sufficient for end users to understand problems, in particular the more complex ones. Instead, a step-by-step -step simulation of the involved rules is helpful for understanding problems. Indeed, participants provided better interpretations af after using the step-by-step -step simulation especially for complex problems uh, like loops. The step-by-step -step simulation in particular, as acknowledged by some participants, helps users understand the problem because it provides a visual representation of a possible runtime evolution of the involved rules. Okay, besides introducing debugging features on top 
of existing interfaces, we also tried to further understand which information end users need to debug their rules and which visual languages are more appropriate. To this end, we performed a literature analysis to extract design guidelines and we implemented MyOT Puzzle, the trigger action programming tool shown in the video. MyOT Puzzle interactively assists users in the composition process by representing triggers and actions as complementary puzzle pieces. Uh, it also empowers users to test the correctness of the defined rules with different real-time feedback. Puzzle pieces, for example, deteriorate over time according to their usage frequency. And when a runtime problem is detected, users can inspect the different textual and graphical explanations and they can dynamically update the problematic rule. We repeated the same exploratory study of UDebug also for MyOT Puzzle. Detailed results are reported in the thesis, but to summarize, we found that uh, the visual languages and feedback adopted by MyOT Puzzle effectively helped participants in avoiding and fixing mistakes during the definition of if there rules. Okay, this concludes my my presentation. This is the outline of my work with the main outcomes for each part of the thesis. And what comes next? We believe that uh, our work provides researchers with insights to inspire further research in the fields of Internet of Things, end user development, and trigger action programming. I would highlight three main aspects that we care about. If we imagine abstract if there are rules, then it becomes important to take into account security and privacy issues. Furthermore, future works would need to test the proposed solutions for defining, the uh, discovering, and debugging rules more in the field with real devices and online services. And finally, future works could also extend the presented approaches and methodologies to be used with uh, more complex versions of the trigger action programming paradigm by supporting, for example, trigger conditions and multiple actions. That's it. Thank you for your attention and I'm open to your questions. Thank you for the presentation. You're welcome. Thank you. Maurizio, I think you're muted. Thank you. You're right, you're right, thanks. So questions, questions from the reviewers maybe. Hi, um, um, Fabio, can I, can I talk? Yeah. Okay. Hi, no, uh, thanks uh, for the presentation. I think it was uh, an interesting work addressing, you know, uh, important and timely issues about uh, how to allow people to have more control of uh, IoT uh, environments. Uh, so, I mean, the question could be uh, because you have this uh, uh, approach to describe uh, in abstract way uh, the rules. I mean, I think one of the main contributions was this use of this uh, uh, semantic description that can provide more, let's say, uh, logical indication about uh, the fact that people want uh, to achieve uh, and so uh, the question here is i mean okay let's assume that people adopt this type of approach uh, but then of course i mean uh, when you have this uh, uh, more uh, abstract logical description and you really want to execute it uh, you may have different ways to actually you know implement this uh, logical uh, description and so have you thought about uh, how to choose which one could be uh, you know the most uh, relevant the most effective uh, uh, from this perspective? yeah thank you for the question um, i think there are different ways of actually executing abstract rules from completely black box solutions like machine learning algorithms to uh, preference-based approaches so in our work, for example, um, we are trying to implement uh, some conversational uh, interfaces uh, that can uh, guide the user to select the right trigger action rule 
uh, on the basis of their abstract uh, need. So the user can specify an abstract goal uh, through a conversational interface, um, and then based on the abstract goal and uh, let's say the long-term preferences of the user, extracted for example for, from uh, her user profile, uh, the conversational agent uh, uh, suggests some rules to the user, and then it allows the user to refine recommendation uh, until, uh, let's say, the right rule is, is recommended and can be activated. So this could be an option starting from uh, the preferences uh, of the user, uh, abstract preferences, and then go down to the, to the actual rule via conversation. Otherwise, there are also obviously black box solutions like machine learning algorithms that can use information about the user to, to decide which rules are, are better. Yeah, I can see. I, I like uh, the idea of the conversational approach. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I mean, another aspect that was interesting, I mean, because your work is mainly based on FTTT, you know, the, which is, I mean, uh, the most adopted. Uh, uh, yeah. uh, it's a commercial tool and so on, but I mean, uh, what are uh, the issues, the problems that you found in this uh, program? I mean, do you think is it the optimal solution or do you think it can be uh, improved? Uh, and if yes, in which directions? You mean the solution of if this and that? Yes. Okay. Uh, so obviously there are problems with, with the platform, uh, also uh, problems that have been highlighted by uh, previous work, uh, mainly again, uh, due to the low level of abstraction of, of the representation models. Uh, and so for, for users that do not have any programming skills, it's really difficult to, uh, to compose such rules and to remember such rules because there are no debugging features. So it's very common to introduce a conflict in, in, your, in your rules. Um, and we selected if this and that because it's one of the most popular platforms uh, in this field and also because unfortunately uh, there are uh, open data about if this and that but not uh, about other platforms so data set in this field uh, are very limited and so we selected uh, if, did, if this and that also for, for this reason. So to test our approaches and tools with real data uh, coming from real users. And so this was another, another reason. But I think that uh, all, the majority of the platforms in this field share, share the same procedures to the rules and share also the same type, type of representation models. So I think that uh, our approaches and tools are generalizable also to other platforms as well. Yeah, for, for example, I mean, because, uh, let's say, in, in our experience, we noticed that uh, uh, one aspect that often, you know, uh, was difficult to understand immediately by people, I mean, is uh, the difference between an event and a condition. I mean, yeah. so you wanted the trigger you know, is uh, associated when there is a change of state or to a condition that lasts for some time. I mean, and I'm not sure if TTT provides clear indication from this viewpoint. Yeah, yeah, this could also be a future work. Uh, so to explore how to insert uh, a distinction between states and events uh, also in our approaches. And this could be obviously a, a future work because, yes, you are right, this is another problem for, for, for end users uh, that we didn't investigate in our work right now, but uh, this could be a, another future work. Yeah. So, um, I, yeah, I, um, so I, I have different questions about different bits of the thesis, but I guess we'll, I'll start with the first question, which is, um, having looked at the, all the contributions that you've made in the different you know, stages, um, if you were to now look back at the EU PONT architecture, yeah. um, are there any weaknesses or limitations that you think are, need to be 
refined and there's scope for future work? And if so, what do you think they are? Yeah, uh, thank you for the question. Um, so uh, the first limitation is that we focused on, let's say, the basic version of the trigger action programming approach. Uh, uh, so uh, we need to uh, modify a little bit the model to also support, uh, for example, triggers conditions and multiple actions. Um, so this could be uh, a future work. Um, obviously, the problem with, with semantic models is uh, their maintainability. Uh, so we could also uh, envision uh, more automatic ways of uh, maintaining such a model uh, to reflect, to map all the functionality modeled by, by uh, trigger action programming platforms. So this is another aspect that we can explore how to uh, automatically and dynamically uh, update uh, the Eupon model, uh, let's say to stay up to date with, with contemporary platforms. And so this is another aspect uh, that, uh, that we, can, we can explore. So if you were to have done that, how would the evaluation um, look, how would that have looked different? Like in the thesis now in section 3.1.4, um, what would you now need to do to evaluate something that has more uh, dynamic features, as you've just said? Uh, yeah, we could, uh, for example, uh, try to extract data uh, from uh, contemporary platforms uh, and from real users, and we could try to automatically generate, uh, update the model starting from, from such data. So a sort of, let's say, uh, mapping between the data extracted from, from uh, real world platforms and our model and uh, test our updating procedure with, with data coming from a real platforms. This could be uh, a way to, to evaluate this, this feature. And then obviously uh, we could also repeat our uh, lab studies uh, about the understandability of, of the definition process with the new model that support uh, multiple actions and, and uh, trigger conditions, obviously. And if you were to do that, would you extend the set of measures that you would use um, to evaluate this new version? Uh, I think yes. Uh, probably yes. I don't know now, but probably yes, uh, especially for, for the, for the uh, for the updating part of, of, of the of the model, uh, mm. we should uh, explore other other metrics. I think. Do you think this would? Um, so this is my last question on this particular topic. Do you do you think this would negatively impact on the user's mental model um, and the ability to grow an understanding? Um, and how would you mitigate the mental model problem? Uh, for you mean for multiple actions and trigger conditions. Yeah, obviously, if it's difficult right now, uh, the trigger action programming approach of if this and that, uh, multiple actions will add complexity for, for the user. So obviously, uh, also web interfaces uh, uh, should be different uh, to support this, type, this new type of information. So we could explore uh, different uh, approaches for, let's say, visualizing uh, rules with multiple actions and, and trigger conditions. Uh, so I think that the if this then that interface is no longer valid, let's say, for, for visualizing uh, multiple actions. So yes, this could be a problem for you, uh, a problem for users, and uh, we surely need to explore this, this feature. Okay. Thank you. All right. Can I? Oh, sorry. Sonia. Okay. Oh, yes. Marianna, if you want. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So I, I just wanted to follow up on, um, on Aaron's question as well. And, and first of all, um, Alberto, 
very nice presentation. Well done. I really enjoyed that presentation. Um, I, I think one thing I would like to hear from you is about um, users. So users are very important in that context. And you said you wanted to focus on people with non-programming skills. Um, but I noticed in your studies, um, you used university students, um, which I assume have yeah. some sort of programming skills. So I just wonder, what's your reflection yeah. of working with users and and what did you learn and maybe how yeah. can you generalize from there? Obviously a limitation of our work is that uh, all our lab studies were conducted with university students, but uh, we paid attention to balance the backgrounds of these students. For example, in the first study with the Eupont uh, uh, ontology uh, used in the definition uh, process, we recruited some students from our university, so with some programming skills, and some students for an, from another university of Turin with any uh, programming experience. And we also explored the, the two groups of users. Uh, obviously, for example, uh, students coming from our university um, used uh, more, uh, were more likely to to use uh, the, the low level details of if this and that. Uh, and so there, there were some differences from the two groups. Uh, but again, obviously we should try these approaches also with other categories of users to better understand our approaches because obviously there are differences also between uh, among uh, university students. So this, this could be another, another uh, future work to, to investigate. So if you could use whatever user group you want, which users would you go and recruit? Would you go for, where is the biggest potential? Uh, I think it could be interesting to evaluate our approaches and tools with maybe uh, younger people uh, that are starting to use this, this, uh, these tools. Uh, maybe for for learning, uh, maybe for uh, personalizing their devices and services. But I think that uh, an interesting evaluation uh, could be with with younger users. I think. Okay, so you didn't consider like the thing is like maybe younger users they might not have the financial resources to have all the different yeah. devices in the home or they might not even have their own home yet. Yeah, so but, you, okay. But you could also uh, use such an, such an approach, let's say, as a teaching, uh, as a teaching tool for understanding, uh, let's say, rule programming or, or some basic concepts about, about uh, programming your, your services and your devices. So, yeah, you are right, this could be a problem, but I think that it could be also interesting to exploit such mechanisms as, as a teaching tool, let's say. But obviously mm -hmm. there are also other categories of, of users that, that could be used in, for investigating our, our approaches and tools. Okay, just, just one more, then I give it to Antonio. Um, from working with users, and obviously data plays an important role, Yeah. Um, what kind of data do you think are you still missing because you have gps data you have uh, preference settings and um you had uh, other kind of data but what do you think is still missing yeah the problem in this domain is that uh, there are no data sets in this field uh, i think uh, that there is only one public data set of if this then the truth that is the one we exploited in, in our evaluations uh, so, and then to uh, explore our approaches uh, in the field, uh, mm -hmm. we need a lot of devices, uh, a lot of applications uh, installed on the user, in the user um, the, uh, devices. And so this is a big problem for, for uh, in this domain. Uh, the big problem is to test uh, such solutions in the wild. So, yeah, we are trying to develop some prototype and then 
uh, putting such prototypes in users' homes, but it's really difficult to, to test our, our solutions uh, in the wild. So this is a big problem that we are trying to fix, but it's still an open problem for us. But if you could add like one data uh, element, what would that be? So you have location, you have maybe preferences. Is there any specific data you would like to, to collect, which you think is currently missing in the data set, even if it's just one? Uh, yeah, uh, we could use, for example, uh, user smartphone to collect uh, so uh, location data and uh, behavioral data from the user. Um, for example, in the data set of if this then rule, uh, all the details are missing. So we, 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 we do not know um, the, the position of the users, uh, the details of the lamp uh, turned on with a given color, all these details are missing. But I think that you could extract a lot of details uh, from the user smartphone. So the user smartphone could be uh, a way to capture some important information in this field. For example, the position is, is, a, is an example. Okay, cool. Thank you. You're welcome. Antonio. Hi. Uh, Alberto, um, very, very interesting work and very nice presentation. Thank you for your presentation. Thank you. Uh, I have just a couple. I, I agree with that, the other members of the, the com committee. Uh, you um, focused on uh, IFTT, that is, uh, a, we can say, a, a successful tool, of course, but it's also very simple. This yeah. is, I think that uh, the, the um, the successful is driven by the, <laughs> is a yeah. very simple uh, application to to internet things to to some action. But uh, this is also a, a kind of limitation of IFTT. Uh, this is why in a at a certain time, in, actually, from <coughs> uh, there's uh, a new tool that is uh, uh, like IFTT that is called was called uh, Atuma that uh, disappeared uh, after a while, uh, that uh, was, uh, um, that carried out some uh, new functionalities that uh, was not provided by IFTT. So, um, one of the questions that um, was uh, raised from IFTT and uh, Atuma uh, coped with uh, was the concurrency. It is one big thing. So in each home, in each house, uh, there is no, uh, not only one user, and many users uh, contribute to to the to the setting of the of the many rules that you can uh, just um, apply. Do you consider? Did you consider? Or uh, what is your feeling about? Uh, how to cope with this, with this uh, actually big issue? Yeah, it is uh, how many people uh, put their hands in the in the rules, uh, and which one is uh, the 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 yeah this the is right one. this is a big problem. Uh, so the model um, is already the open model already supports multiple users, uh, so it can handle multiple users. Um, but we need to explore, uh, let's say, conflicts among uh, rules exactly. between, between users. Um, so there are, I think, many possibilities ranging from uh, priorities, so users can define yeah. priority over, over a rule, to, let's say, more preference-based approaches, more, for example, conversational approaches, and also debugging mechanism, because I think that this is a problem that could be solved through a, through a debug interface, uh, such as the one that uh, we, we explored, so you debug and my other puzzle. Uh, so this is another uh, work that we can explore in the, in the future. Uh, but Do you have I, an I, idea how to cope this? Yeah, again, uh, priority could be, could be an option. Uh, so uh, maybe there are different types of users in the system. Uh, 
that have different capabilities, let's say different uh, authorizations. Uh, and if priority uh, doesn't work, uh, then it could be useful to introduce uh, some further debugging features on top of our, our tools for, for debugging rules. This could be another option. My, thank you. My second question is, uh, is uh, strictly related because uh, another uh, uh, limitation uh, from uh, this kind of tools is from my FTP is that uh, the, the trigger is uh, strictly related to one, uh, um, to one center or to, to one uh, activator, okay? Um, what about uh, when you, uh, you have to consider more than one uh, sensor? So, uh, yeah. Let's say you, you made the, uh, an example uh, that in which smartphone is the locator provider, okay? Mm -hmm. And you mentioned the, the smartphone is the locator provider. Yeah. And you mentioned the bathroom. So uh, I suppose that uh, I, I cannot go to the bathroom with the, 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 the smartphone. So I need to, to move from one smart, uh, uh, locator to another, such as uh, a smartwatch or, uh, or just uh, a, a smart a fit, everything else. Yeah. Do you consider this, uh, this, um, uh, yeah. this scenario? In this your... was actually the vision of the Elpon model. So to have abstract triggers, for example, on, on the location that can dynamically adapt to your devices, to the current device that you are using or the current sensor that you are, that you are approaching. So this was the vision of the Elpon model and the vision of the first part of the thesis that was the definition of abstract rules that can be adapted to different contextual situations. But then again, there is the problem of selecting the right device uh, to execute such uh, abstract triggers. So this is an open problem that we are investigating. But again, this was the vision of the Elpon model at the beginning. So to define abstract uh, behaviors that can adapt to different devices and different sensors. Okay, last question. Um, you, you, you presented the user study at the beginning with uh, uh, actually uh, regarding the, the abstract work, okay? The, your work toward uh, to abstracting the, the, the behavior of the sensors of IoT devices. Uh, you, um, you provided 30, uh, 30 students. Uh, the, 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 the mean age uh, was uh, 22 years old, right? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Do you think that this uh, could be um, could provide uh, um, uh, a bias in the study because uh, in each uh, uh, home, in each house, uh, is really is actually the mean age uh, 22? I don't think so. I a, a typical uh, family. <laughs> You have uh, two yeah. opposites. We have the, the very smart people that are children, or, or yeah. at least uh, close to the the mainly in this period, actually. <laughs> mainly in this period, they are, this, yeah. this, uh, thank you for the question. This is a limitation, and obviously, uh, mm -hmm. if we need to, for example, uh, evaluate. Uh, priority over rules and different types of users. Obviously, uh, we need different types. As Mariana told, you need to enlarge the... Yeah. yeah, so we need some parents, some children, and so on. So this is uh, obviously a limitation of our, our lab studies. So you are right. Okay, thank you very much. Nice presentation, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. I'm okay. okay. So, uh, I think I'm the last one. Uh, Alberto, congratulations, uh, very nice work. Uh, the presentation was very clear and uh, all the parts of your work were well, well connected. So nice work, uh, congratulations again. Thank you. 
Uh, my, my observation follows uh, Mariana's observation. So from my point of view, I mean, my, my feeling uh, is that the, the users of your uh, technologies are computer people. I don't know, do, do you really think that uh, on the long run, this can be used by any, okay, let's forget the old people like us. Let's focus on younger people. I mean, uh, millennials and so on. So people who live, uh, are born with, with computers and smartphones. But even in that case, do you really think that the 90% of them could use this technology or? It's really difficult to say, I right. think. Uh, probably yes, due to the spread of new smart devices and online services, probably we will need some solutions to put together the behaviors of our devices and services. But again, it's really difficult to say. Mm. Uh, I think yes, but probably also, also your, your question is, is right. I don't know. But um, probably the continuous growth of the IoT, uh, these solutions will uh, will also be used from users that do not have any programming skills, so probably. Yeah, now I remember a, a discussion really with Fulvio uh, about the fact that uh, in, in a perfect world, uh, in, in elementary school, in primary school, uh, students uh, learn programming, some kind of easy high-level programming, but maybe in that world, uh, if this is the trend, uh, then maybe yes. But my other uh, observation was um, today something like that is Alexa. I mean, a way of interacting with technology available to anyone. Uh, I don't know what's the diffusion of Alexa and similar tools now, but I think they will diffuse. So how would you envisage, uh, let's say, a link between your... Yeah technology and uh, let's say front-end uh, like Alexa? Thank you for the question. We are exploring this problem right now. Um, so uh, we, are, uh, we developed a conversational agent uh, to define if there rules uh, via conversation. Uh, so the user can uh, write or speak with our conversational agent to define the trigger and then the action. And now we are extending this conversational agent uh, to uh, actually recommend trigger action rules to the user. Uh, so uh, in this case, the user can uh, talk with the, with the conversational agent to define um, her abstract goal, her abstract current goal. Then the conversational agent uses such abstract goal to recommend a first set of uh, if then rules that can be activated and then um, through uh, different dialogues um, the user can refine the recommendations uh, to get more precise uh, if then rules for 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 our needs so this is uh, a problem that we are starting to address uh, right now so using a conversational agent to define define these types of personalizations. And beyond the, the conversation, um, which in a sense still delegates the construction of the rule to the, to the person, mm -hmm. could you envisage a way of uh, reconstructing the rules from the facts, from the events? So you have a, yeah. you have a, a, a log of any type of events, whatever, either in the house or, or not only in the house. Yeah, so yes, that could also be uh, reconstructing the rules from facts. Yeah, this could be another option. So uh, mm -hmm. suggesting rules to automate uh, common behaviors of, of the user, uh, sort of, or, or also, let's say, uh, a sort of programming by demonstration. So the user perform a behavior in, their, uh, in, the, in her home, and then the system is, is able to suggest a rule to automate such a behavior over time. So this could be another interesting feature to, to explore. Final observation, maybe it's a bit outside your, your topic, but what about privacy? Because all this data, especially in their home and not only, is of, 
of course sensitive so what's yeah, your take? i'm not a privacy expert but mm -hmm. i think that as i as i highlighted in the slides the privacy is an important topic that was uh, highlighted also by our participants uh, when dealing with abstract behaviors uh, such as light up a place or when I'm and or, or the trigger when I'm entering a place, so this is a, obviously an important topic to be be explored. But I'm not a privacy expert, so I'm not sure to answer your your question correctly. Uh, but again, it's an important topic to to investigate. This is the important thing. Uh, I mean. Okay. Okay. So congratulations again. Any Thank other question from anyone in the audience? Yeah, I have a sort of a, a low level question that I was kind of, I, I reread the, the revised version and I was just, it's, it's still kind of burning, burning my um, interest. Uh, when you did the work on the um, uh, rec rules, uh, yeah. you've got, a, you know, some nice results here, uh, but I was really interested as uh, the, uh, the entity graph embedding approach that was done by Oramos. Yeah. Um, to my knowledge, that seems much more computationally efficient than your approach. Is that true? More comp uh, you mean it's 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 not so burden it's it's not such a big burden on the computer, the entity graph embedding, whereas your approach seems more um, computationally heavy. Yeah, yeah, this is this is true. Uh, because we need to build the graph and so this takes time. Um, but uh, so you are right. But such a graph can be also filtered if you consider um, only the uh, entities owned by a given user. So if you are performing uh, recommendations for a given user, uh, you can build a graph by exploiting only triggers and actions supported by the. Uh, entities owned by the user and this allowed the algorithm to, to to be faster i mean but yeah you are right the the computation is is also a problem for for the computational cost is also a problem for for recruits so we need time to build a graph yeah did you ever consider any sort of hybrid because i was thinking about how i would have basically built kind of I would have put, kind of put some rec rules inside the nodes of the entity graph embedding. Did you ever try that? No, but thank you for the suggestion. This could be obviously an option. Yeah. Um, the I guess the the other kind of question I have in this kind of whole section is, um, this is a very nice, exhaustive you know set of experiments that you've done here with all of these sort of you know nearest neighbor algorithms and different approaches, um, and the, the discussion and the conclusion at the end here is pretty, um, it doesn't leave a lot of, uh, it doesn't have a lot of reflection on what, what other people should do to follow up on this. You know, how can, because you know, the, the accuracy here is, is okay, but there's, there's still a, a lot to go. So, you know, your conclusions are, um, there's not much in the conclusions to be honest. Yeah, thank you for, for, the, for the question. Uh, I think that um, an important point of this work is uh, the usage of such connections between, between items um, in terms of functionality. Uh, and so I think that the important point here are the features we use. Uh, it's not the algorithm we use to uh, no. compute recommendations, but important points are the features that we use to train these algorithms. So uh, I think that this is the, the key point of this part of, of the thesis. Mm. It, it kind of, it marries what both um, Maurizio and Mariana were saying is that I was trying to understand how I would take the recommendation from your system and provide it to a normal person, not a computer science person. And I think I would have a very hard time imagining a normal person interpreting this and actually making sensible use of the recommendations? Uh, yeah, uh, this is the reason why we 
envision the, the, the use of the recommender system during the uh, rule definition process. So there is a, a user that uh, is already defining a rule and then uh, recruits is able to suggest you some actions to autocomplete what sure, you're defining. So, I mean, we, we've, we did some work here on um, like similar kind of, you know, rule-based systems using kind of block-based languages. And the number of people who actually author is very small. The number of people who reuse and compose is very large. Um, and that's, I think, that's, I think that's true in IFT data sets that I've seen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The user percentages are much, much higher than the authoring percentages. Yeah, yeah, you are, you are right. And this is also reflected in, in the data set we use in the, in the evaluation. So, yes. Yeah, but thank you again. Sorry, I, I should have, in my previous question, I should have said thank you for the presentation. And also thank you for the revisions to the thesis. I think that the new structure is much, much better because now yeah. it's very clear where you think the contributions are. Um, and going back to the contributions, you break it down very nicely in a nice, in a nice graphic, actually, that I, I will be encouraging my own students to use because I like that way of looking at the contributions on one page rather than lots of text. That's, that was quite nice. Um, but the one thing I was wondering is, uh, what do you think the percentages are across those three areas? Like if you had to kind of weigh up now, uh, like the Merchant of Venice, if you had to weigh up the 100% the weight of the contribution to knowledge, where is, where is the percentage in each of those three areas in the contribution to knowledge? Uh, I think that the, the most important part of, of, the, of our work is the, the debugging part. Uh, because um, problems in if then rules can be uh, problematic, let's say, and also dangerous. Uh, and unfortunately, contemporary solutions uh, uh, do not offer any debugging features for, for end users. And so I think that also, if you are imaging uh, such technologies in the wild, uh, debugging mechanisms uh, would be important uh, sure. and so i think that this is the the most important part of, of our work so what's the uh um what are the what are the percentages for these three so you've got higher level abstraction discovery and debugging what what numbers would you put on those three categories let's say uh 30 20 and 50. okay that seems yeah. reasonable and if, if, they, if people have other questions, I have one kind of important question I want to ask at the end, but I'll wait unless other people have other questions first. Can I just ask one uh, question because of the assignment of the, the numbers? So you gave debugging quite a big junk. And I just wonder if you had any reflection of debugging in the context of um, AI, I mean, in the advances of AI, do we need to debug? I mean, if you're thinking about automation and then all the systems will make the rules and the decisions and they learn over time through the data we acquire. So if you go like 20, 50 years ahead, yeah. will you need it? Yeah, debugging mechanisms, I think, would be also important uh, to uh, understand the choices made by AI. So we, we could use the same approaches like step-by-step -step simulations to, to understand, to, to better understand the choices of, of potential AI uh, tools. Uh, and again, I think that also with AI, uh, some problems could happen anyway. So I think that uh, Debugging will still be an important, an important feature for foreign users to understand the behavior of their devices and services in, in their homes. But do you think people care? Because as long as it's working, people will not care. It's like driving a car. I, I don't yeah. really know exactly the details on the engine and how it works, yeah. but when something is wrong, I go to the, the, the garage and the guy plugs in the laptop and then it So So just like, who really wants to understand the problem? I mean, as, as Aaron said, we maybe are not the normal people. We are questioning everything, but do people really want to know? Or is there going to be a specialized group of experts? Uh, yeah, it could, it could not. Um, I don't know right now, uh, but I think that at least some 
features of, of the debugging mechanism like step-by-step uh, -step simulation could be useful for any users, at least to understand why uh, their devices and services are, are executing some, some actions. So I think that at least some, some features of, of the debugging could be useful also for, for users who do not have any programming skills and do not. I, I, I don't, I don't uh, expect an answer, but I, I think it will come also back to what's the service. I mean, if it's just the light and the temperature, I don't care. But IoT is becoming part of, I don't know, how we are dating in the future, how we are going to um, give birth to our babies or whatever. So everything is becoming digitized. Yeah. So it's an, there's a difference in importance in services. And oh. I guess in certain uh, areas, you really want to know the problems and the bug. But in others, you can just hand it over. Yeah. Yeah. Just as a reflection, it's quite interesting. Thank you. But I have a question about, I mean, uh, the final part about uh, the MyOT environment, uh, which if I well understood, it was a kind of, uh, you know, visual syntax for FTTT, I mean, that environment. But FTTT, I mean, you can select the trigger, then you can, you know, specify some more details about the rule. So it was not very clear to me uh, how you address this uh, more <laughs> detail. Yeah, when you drag a puzzle pieces uh, in, in the drop area, uh, a pop-up will appear and you can select the details of, of your trigger or, or your action. Okay, so you, you did not want to consider the kind of information in the structure of the puzzle pieces, I mean. Yeah. Know, yeah. We have chosen also different solutions. So. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we followed some design guidelines that are reported in the thesis, but in this case, when you drag and drop a puzzle pieces in the drop area, you can complete the details with a pop-up form. Okay. So I have, I have my sort of my end questions, if that's okay, Maurizio? Absolutely. Okay, so um, again, you're, uh, if you finish today and you pass, you'll, you'll have a PhD and then you'll be asked by other people to help judge their work and give them advice. And you need to know what makes a PhD and what isn't a PhD. So um, why did you decide in the revision to the thesis to get rid of personalizing user behavior and the sections on analyzing digital tools and self-monitoring to habit formation. Why did you decide to get rid of that? This was an hard choice for me to, to delete, let's say, such part from the thesis. This was actually a project uh, born in the last year of my PhD uh, that was also published in important conferences such as Kai. Mm -hmm. And uh, but I decided to remove it. Uh, because you were right, uh, the thesis was uh, the two parts of the thesis uh, were uncorrelated, and it was uh, very difficult to link together the two parts under uh, a sa the same link. So I decided to follow your suggestions, uh, and now I think that the thesis uh, has a more clear structure. And again, there are the papers for, for the other parts and I'm satisfied with, with, with the papers and I'm also satisfied with the thesis that now it's more, more clear. That's, that's the right answer, okay. <laughs> um, the, the, the wrong answer is I cut it because you told me to is the wrong no. answer. Because you, want, you want to look back on the work and go, now you can recognize what advice you need to give to other people. Um, so my second, my last, second last question, which is hopefully a, an easy one is uh, you, like you cleaned everything up, you made all the corrections I may, I, I recommend it. So it's really, really nicely done. Uh, your reference 67 and 68 are still the same paper. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> almost, almost perfect, almost perfect. Okay. Um, my last question is uh, kind of just interest to see what you would think about the future. So if I was to now like pick up your thesis and if I had a new student who was coming and they were saying like, oh, I'm really interested in IoT, I love end user programming, blah, blah, blah. I'd be like, oh, I've just examined a really nice thesis. It's really well put together. It's really nicely focused. And you said it, you said the third section is debugging. 
But actually, to me, I would actually tell a student to not look at that as debugging, but look at that as refactoring. And what I would say is, imagine now you have all of these I IoT systems deployed around the world, and along comes COVID-19, and you're an administrator of a hospital, or you're working in a home, or you're working in a factory, and you have to go back and change the rule systems that are built around those to take advantage of social distancing or uh, rules around temporality, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You know, instead of thinking about it debugging, just thinking about it as like lifelong refactoring of code because big things change, new devices show up, new systems show up, pandemics show up. So what would you recommend to, the, to my student if they want to kind of take this and refact and think of it as for refactoring existing systems rather than debugging systems? Uh, I think that with this um, problem, uh, you could use the approach, the basic approach that is, uh, let's say, uh, that is the Elpon model. Uh, so maybe with more abstract rules uh, that can be adapted to, to different contexts, to different devices, to different services, it would be, it would be more easy to, to change uh, such rules uh, according to the, the current situation. So in this case... Yeah. But, then I think, but then I think what's important is to have an abstraction that is the change, because that's the thing you want to be able to publish. You don't want to be able to publish the new rules because people won't know how to find them, but, changing, but publishing the changes so that other people can understand how they need to adapt their own rules. That's the, that's the data object that I think you would have to somehow capture. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, I understand your question. So, um, like, so if I'm if I'm removing things and if I'm adding things, the the the, the new set of the new if then else structure is not what I want to publish. I want to say you need to go into these sections and add in these extra components, and that applies across all the rules, not just this one rule. Yeah, but uh, so you mean uh, what is the part of the thesis that can be? that can be expanded to reflect. Uh, yeah. Maybe the, the, the recommendation of, of new rules based on, on, on the current situation. So, so based on the context, uh, the recommender system can adapt itself yeah. to, to recommend other types of rules depending on the situation. I think that's where that's a very good place to start for a student uh, improving the recommender system by taking in more context and yeah, then using context, their that's that's Thank you. That's my that's all that's all for me. Other questions? Okay, so I'm I'm always surprised that these uh, distant uh, meetings work. I think it was an interesting discussion. <laughs> and uh, okay, thanks to COVID for <laughs> permitting even these interesting discussions um, okay so if you, uh, I, think, I think if Alberto stops sharing his slides I, we, sorry. we can be bigger we can be bigger yeah yeah <laughs> now bigger so I think we can start the uh, close doors discussion for the board